A prince born in 1615 in Ajmer was groomed to be the next Grand Mughal Emperor. Dara Shuko is perhaps early modern India's greatest what-ifs. How would the Mughal Empire be if he, rather than Aurangzeb, became emperor? We talked to Yale professor Dr. Supriya Gandhi about the man who might have been a great emperor. Hi, I'm Supriya Gandhi. I'm a historian and I teach at Yale University and I am the author of a book on Dara Shuko called The Emperor Who Never Was and um, Dara Shuko is the subject of my conversation with you today. I think there's a strong argument to be made from looking at the sources in his time that it would have been pronounced Dara Shuko. Of course, we can never be 100% sure. So Dara Shuko is a fairly familiar figure to anyone growing up in South Asia. So when I was growing up, uh, I don't think I can pinpoint a moment when I discovered Dara Shuko. But the process of going back to Dara Shuko's time and studying Dara Shuko as situated in his own context is certainly a period of discovery. So I think the way to discover that Dara Shuko is to perhaps not think that we're necessarily going into his inner mind, kind of perceiving his thoughts, his inner motivations, because that's something we can't really do. But what we do have are layers and layers of historical memory. We have our own modern conceptions that are shaped by the concerns of our own times. We have the writings of various um, Europeans and other British colonialists who wanted to portray Dara Shuko in a particular way, uh, often to uh, make an argument for the necessity of colonial rule. And then we have the historical memory of the people who came after Dara Shuko. And as we know, Dara Shuko was a prince who was groomed to be an emperor, but he never actually became an emperor. So history is often told by those who achieve power. Uh, so we have rather critical narratives of Dara Shuko that come stem from that period, from the late 17th century and then from the 18th century. But if we go back to Dara Shuko's own times and look at the sources, and look at the sources without necessarily um, seeing uh, them through the lens of a, a predetermined end, then we can actually look, get, um, sort of have in view a range of representations, a kaleidoscopic so, sort of mosaic of different representations that we that then lead us closer to his time period. So my uh, initial methodology was to go to Dara Shuko's own writings and to see what they were in dialogue with. What are the ideas, the motifs, the themes that Dara Shuko's own writings drew upon and engaged with? And he has a range of writings. He was very prolific. He has various writings on Sufism, biographies of Sufi saints, writings that extol his own um, Sufi teachers uh, of the Qadri order. Uh, that also include a, you know, a bit of spiritual autobiography. He has a kind of guidebook for spiritual realization. He has collections of the ecstatic utterances of saints. He has his own divan of poetry. And then there is this whole uh, level of engagement with Indic thought that he actually brings about through his conversations with Vaishnava religious figures, for instance, uh, pundits from Benares, uh, and a range of interlocutors. Initially, my question was, you know, how does he portray himself? What kind of a picture do we get? Do we get the picture of a prince who actually didn't want to be a prince? Somebody who wanted to step away from rulership and just live in some kind of ivory tower or an ascetic's cave and devote himself to the uh, study and practice of mysticism um, and so on. But that's actually not the picture I got. I got a picture of someone who was very, very interested in his own spiritual development. Uh, he was somebody who was clearly 
working on the pattern of previous Mughal emperors, his grandfather Jahangir, his great-grandfather Akbar. He wasn't acknowledging that, but he really also saw himself as a ruler, a ruler in the making and as some kind of de facto ruler and definitely a future ruler. For me, what is most fascinating is because he was so um, prolific, because the context in which he lived and worked at the court was so culturally vibrant, because we can trace what he is doing to other conversations that are uh, taking place uh, elsewhere in the Mughal Empire and beyond, uh, that the, there's such a richness of source material, one can just go on studying them and they yield new insights and new connections. One can certainly map Dara Shukur's life just through political events, you know, his um, his birth, um, various kind of important events, his eventual um, loss in the battle of, for succession, and then his uh, his death. So, so that's one way of looking at Dara Shukur's life. Uh, but we mustn't forget that he was at the um, the center of really, really active court patronage, uh, where there were buildings that were constructed. Uh, there were numerous paintings that were made in his workshops, uh, some of which he may have shared with his father, and various other objects uh, that were used. The important insights that we get from looking at these objects is that we often see things that are not necessarily discussed in the texts. So when, if Dara Shoko was having a painting commissioned, or if there was a painting that we might assume came from his own patronage uh, and circles, uh, we don't necessarily get a whole interpretation of it or a description of it or even an account of it in the court chronicles or in his own writings. So we get this completely different insight into, no doubt, you know, what was a collaborative process between Dara Shukur, uh, and his artists. So we see the agency of his artists in their own uh, interpretation, you know, of, um, of the themes that, uh, that were chosen and the style of, uh, the style in which they were portrayed and so on. So paintings are definitely one really important area of focus. Another important axis uh, to consider is that of architecture. Uh, Dara Shuko, as we know, was a great um, patron of architecture. Uh, he also, and together with his sister Jahanara, who was also a very, very important patron, uh, they are responsible for the construction of a number of buildings, for instance, several in Kashmir that are also associated, uh, linked with the Qadri order, um, to which he was very close over there. Both of them were very close to it, uh, as well as Shah Jahanabad, Lahore. Uh, so there are many centers where we still see the material evidence of Dara Shukud's architectural patronage. And then there are other objects that he may have used. For instance, there is a sword uh, at the v &A Museum, uh, which has an inscription linking it to, to Dara Shuko. So that's also uh, an insight uh, that we have into something that he actually used. 